Welcome, everybody. Really um, happy you're all here, and thanks so much for joining us um, today for our first of our two-part series um, on skills building workshop in science policy writing for advocacy. So before handing things over to our moderator, um, I'm just going to say a couple words about NSPN and the advocacy committee. Uh, for those who aren't familiar or are new to NSPN, NSPN is an association of civically engaged individuals, as well as local chapters. Uh, we focus on providing educational opportunities, such as this workshop, um, for those interested in building skills, creating networks, and advancing their careers. So the Advocacy Committee specifically encourages members to actively participate in the policy process um, and interact with those affected by it. Um, we meet every fourth Monday of the month. So if you wanna check out what we're, we have uh, going on, our next meeting is October 23rd at 8 p.m. Eastern time. You can register on the NSPN website or join the Advocacy Slack channel. Um, I'd also like to advertise our uh, closely related committee. It's a new committee, the Science Policy Committee. Um, and we're always open to new members. And I will put uh, the email addresses for both advocacy and policy in the chat. And um, feel free to reach out with questions or interest. And with that, I will hand it over to our moder moderator, Piyush. Thank you, Jane, and hello, everyone, and welcome to this first of the exciting series. Today, we have a very distinguished speaker. Uh, so before that, I am also an associate editor of JSPG, and she is the new CEO. So in a way, she is my boss. <laughs> so coming to the bio of Dr. Julianne McCall, she serves as Director of Precision Medicine at the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. And in that role, she oversees cross-sector health policy, working groups and projects, research grant making, state government interagency efforts, and a lot of roles, which include co-authoring the first ever California Surgeon General's report. Previously, she has worked on public health and research policy in the California Senate Office of Research and as a science and technology policy fellow of the CCST. Prior to her career in policy, she spent 16 years in neuroscience research labs, including at the Salk Institute, Stanford, the Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic, and the National Center for Microscopy Imaging Research. She conducted medical research as a Fulbright Fellow in Sweden and as a neuroscientist at the Neuro Regeneration Laboratory at Heidelberg University in Germany. In her community work, she teaches graduate science policy courses at UC Davis, UC Riverside, and the Japan US Science Policy Fellowship. And as I already said, she is leading the Journal of Science Policy and Governance and is one of the board of directors of Future of Research and the board of Sacramento chapter of New Leaders Council. She also occasionally directs the International Brain B Neuroscience Olympiad for high school students and is the co-founder of TEDx Fulbright, local science outreach organizations and a chapter of the Sustained Dialogue Campus Network for Racial Justice. Academically, she earned a PhD in neurosciences from Heidelberg University in Germany, a master's in biomedical sciences from UC San Diego, and a bachelor's in neuroscience from Denison University. So with that, I'm honored to call Julianne. Uh, Piyush, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Um, I'm, I'm blushing a little at how kind your words are. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled. Hi, everybody. It's uh, it's always nice to see some familiar faces and names on my screen. Um, when you get down to it, the movers and shakers in science policy, we cross paths so frequently um, in various platforms. I also wanted to uh, to point out that um, a member of our governing board on the Journal of Science Policy and Governance um, has also joined us. Um, Ms. Shelkin, we are absolutely honored um, to have you join. Uh, and I am so excited by the honor in this new CEO and managing publisher role to, uh, to be able to work with such tremendous 
leaders um, on a global scale. Thank you, um, Juliana. I just want to congratulate you and say how proud we all are of your amazing successes. And I am in oh awe goodness. of what you're doing and how you're doing. And not only me personally, but we all really uh, welcoming you uh, with all our hearts and minds and applauding your amazing success stories and sharing your wisdom, so to speak. Thank you, Juliana. And congratulations with being a new CEO. That's really exciting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I thought my cheeks were blushing before. They're uh, lobster red at this point. I hope the lighting is <laughs> catching that too much. Um, but with science policy, like with so many fields, we are standing on shoulders of countless uh, folks who've come before us. Um, and uh, and it's that kind of network that really moves the needle, particularly in policy, which moves at the at the at the speed of trust. Um, and uh, it looks like there are twenty nine of us um, in real time in this uh, workshop right now. And just looking around the the screen room, looking out around the virtual room, um, these are our colleagues, right? These are the folks that we can start calling on as they step into you know, increasingly um, more authoritative positions, each with uh, 29 different perspectives on the world and, and different fields. So um, I'm, I'm really privileged to be here and, and contribute to this workshop. NSPN, I'm absolutely honored um, by the invitation. So without, uh, without further introduction, um, let's just dive right in. Feel free to place um, questions in the chat. I won't be as diligent about uh, reading through, but Jane and Piyush, if you don't mind keeping an eye and feel free, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to pause um, and answer any questions in real time rather than waiting till the end. So don't hesitate to engage. Um, I will be uh, opening the floor to discussion afterwards um, after a brief uh, 20 slide presentation. Um, so you'll have a chance to unmute yourselves um, as well. So oh, just getting to um, getting to a ground level, like, why are we here? Why am I here? Um, I have a really busy job. I have really busy jobs, plural now. Um, but I think we're all called with a scientific background. We're all called to fill this gap that just continues to increase from decades, if not centuries, of uh, neglecting a scientific perspective in pol public policy decision making. Um, you know, I was very happy in academic research labs, um, but the more research, uh, the more newspapers I read, the more TED Talks I listened to, um, the more I realized that there was just this widening gap between where science was going and where the public was going, not just the slower pace at the public level, but um, but a whole other trajectory altogether with anti-vaxxer movement and climate denialism, climate change denialism, um, and other you know disturbing trends. Um, and I you know thought to myself, I really wish someone would do something about that. Um, and uh, you know looked in the mirror and thought, well, might as well give it a try. So. Um, here I am seven years in, I made the jump um, almost exactly seven years ago into uh, policy at the state level um, here in California. Um, and it really just continues to be a privilege to work in public policy where you get to ask questions like what allows individuals to live together in functioning societies? Maybe there's something I can do about it. Or what conditions lead people to struggle and or thrive? Um, in different in different settings, um, how do societal rules, particularly policies, shape the way our world looks, and how equitable is it? Um, how does perspective influence policy development and implementation? When it comes down to things, we think of policy as this strict infrastructure of uh, laws and regulations and rules, and yes, it is. However. Um, I think we've all seen, uh, you know, the cannabis legalization movement. That is still an illegal substance at the federal level, and yet at the state level, more than half half of states have now approved it um, for medical and or recreational use. Um, so, depends on who is leading the Department of Justice at the federal level um, that regulates how closely that's uh, in those federal laws are enforced. That it perpetuates across 
federal, state, and local policy. It really comes down to the individuals um, with that decision-making authority. So uh, it's my dream to make all 28 of you who join me today um, in, into those roles, um, whether it's uh, private or public sector. So an entire approach um, that I want to emphasize throughout this presentation is upstream thinking. We don't just want to identify policy challenges and then place a Band-Aid, right, that saves the day for now, but recognizing that it might resurface as a larger problem um, months, if not years, down the road. So for those of you unfamiliar with this upstream uh, concept, it's most popularized in uh, public health. Um, you know, imagine yourself walking with a group of friends <clears throat> um, alongside a river and you see someone drowning and, you know, instinctively you jump right in, right, to rescue that person um, from the rapids, pull them to safety, and all of a sudden you see three other people drowning in the river. You Three of your friends jump in, do, do exactly as you've done, right, rescue them from the rapids, um, but your fifth friend, your fourth friend, right, starts to walk upstream and you see more people coming down the river needing saving and you say, you know, hey, friend, what are you doing? We need, we, don't you see we need help here? Um, and their comment is, uh, I'm going to walk upstream to see if I can prevent people from um, falling into the river in the first place. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the TED Talk by Rishi Manchanda, one of the best TED Talks um, uh, in my experience of exactly what this looks like in um, current healthcare right now. So thinking in public policy, again, it's a tremendous privilege, also a tremendous responsibility to think of the root causes of these various issues, similar to your approach to, uh, to your science as well. We don't wanna just put those Band-Aids on symptoms. Um, we want to prevent and or adjust from the root. Um, I had the privilege of being uh, at this TED Talk in 2012 in um, Qatar, uh, where uh, Shireen El Feki, who was then vice chair of the UN's Global Commission on HIV and the Law, made this statement. Coming up with a vaccine for HIV or a cure for AIDS, now that's rocket science, but changing the law isn't. And while at the time I was still in research, I thought, absolutely, right? I mean, just changing some words on a page, like, how hard? Should that be when we absolutely know that you know, HIV and AIDS is a you know a, a, a curse on humanity, and we have the opportunity to potentially change it with you know more mosquito nets and um, sorry that's from malaria. <laughs> what am I saying? Right with you know greater informational campaigns and um, you know um, you know educational programs, um, you know condom availability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but then I got into science, science policy, and uh, I have to say it's not as easy as I thought uh, 11 years ago sitting in that audience. Um, so looking at our policy workshop here, I want you to think deeply about why you are here, right? What led you to consider science policy, whether you're coming in with a STEM background or otherwise, um, it's that, you know, anchor to your purpose um, that will really keep you driving forward. Not all of policy work um, is uh, flowers and butterflies. <laughs> there, there, there are going to be some, some tough times. It's a roller coaster up and down. Uh, for those of you familiar with um, the interview, famous interview by Dr. Ru uh, Dr. Um, Justice, Ru past Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, she considered uh, a better symbol of America rather than the bald eagle, um, a, a, a better symbol would be a, a pendulum as we are just constantly, right, in our public policy, swinging from what seems like extreme to extreme, but hopefully centering more on a reasonable path forward. Um, so with those ups and downs, anchoring your efforts to uh, a larger, purpose um, will keep you uh, contributing effectively. I think many of us get into policy, like I mentioned before, um, reading the news and watching TED Talks and being just existentially frustrated by um, the lack of societal embracing of 
um, scientific advances. And I have to say, I've learned a thing or two about what leads to those chasms between science and policy, um, whether information is poorly trans, uh, translated. Um, there was a, a talk by California Health and Human Services Secretary, um, uh, Michael Wilkening in the past, <clears throat> when he was asked about, you know, just the wealth of California-based health research and how much that contributes to his uh, agency, Health and Human Services Agency. And he flat out said, you know, 98% of all the research being done has absolutely nothing to say about policy decision-making. Um, and that really resonated with me as I thought, well, surely we just need, you know, better communicators. And yes, that's one part of it, but also more tailored research to include the factors that are most poignant in policy conversations. And of course, poorly designed policy um, when implemented uh, could have negative effects on lives. And that's what we want to try to avoid while also promoting, um, you know, just spectacular ground chain, you know, world changing, ground shaking policy solutions. So policymaking principle versus practice. Um, who are policymakers? We all know the elected officials, but who are some additional policymakers? Um, let me ask for a little bit of uh, engagement here. Feel free to, to unmute or place in chat if you're more comfortable there. Who do we consider policymakers? Oh, Gabrielle, thank you so much for including the TED Talk in the chat. Don't be shy. I I could just start calling on people. Yeah, so members of Congress, absolutely. So this is our legislative branch at our federal level, absolutely. So again, members of Congress, whether they're uh, in the House of Representatives or the Senate, fabulous. Um, advocacy groups, 100%. I'll tell you in California, um, between 95, around 95%, of all legislation pitched to California, uh, to the California legislature, sorry, that the California legislature enacts, over 95% of them come from advocacy organizations, whether they're corporations with an advocacy arm um, or nonprofit organizations or universities with advocacy efforts. Um, staffers, absolutely. So the members of offices actually gathering and synthesizing information on behalf of uh, elected officials. Advisors, 100%. Executive branch, Sarah Bogart, thank you so much. Yes, the executive branch um, officials are more often appointed. There are some that are elected, for example, um, in California, we have an attorney general who's elected, um, but your uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency um, Secretary, that's an appointed position um, as are uh, members of most executive branch. Staff members, excellent um, legislators, local city commissioners, city council members, think tanks. Thank you so much, um, Shishen. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Think tanks, absolutely. Whether they're uh, within an academic organization or an independent nonprofit think tank, 100%. Regulators, Manar, thank you, um, right, within exec regulatory executive branch organizations. So yes, a scientist and government whose advice informs policy, 100%. You can consider those executive branch um, staff members. Companies, Gladys, thank you so much. Right, right. The private sector absolutely is engaged in policy making um, via their lobbying groups or otherwise. Um, really appreciate that. So, are policymakers always subject matter experts? <laughs> no. Um, there are literally not enough minutes in the year, even if you didn't sleep, to be able to read all the information that comes across a policymaker's desk. And that includes, right, policy ideas, advocacy memos and one pagers, like we're going to get to in a moment, um, amendments, support letters, opposition letters. Um, they are, it's impossible to be a subject matter expert in every policy topic that comes across 
um, their screen or their desk. So they really have to be more like referees. Um, like I mentioned before, policies advance the speed of trust. So having a known entity, an organization that shepherds an idea um, through the legislative process um, or through the regulatory rulemaking process, um, that is your that is typically the best bet to um, to see a policy succeed. Um, their time is extremely short, right? Policymakers will wake up on a daily basis with 200 emails in their inbox. They'll have multiple staff members taking multiple meetings, sometimes as short as five to 10 minutes, right? And their day is just packed, right? From morning till very late at night when they have fundraisers, receptions, when they're supporting local efforts, local events. Um, so just to appreciate, we I think we often put a little too much um, responsibility on our policymakers and, uh, fail to recognize that it really takes a village, an entire ecosystem around policymaking. Um, so finally, thanks for letting me lead into that um, so long. Uh, what is an advocacy one pager? Um, so it is a um, formal definition. It's a vehicle to communicate evidence for policymakers for subsequent action. So it has some substance, right? Data or otherwise evidence. Um, for policymakers, your intended audience, um, for action. So it's not just, you know, for information only, right? It's actually compelling them on a particular ask, which we'll get into a little long, uh, later. Um, it's a concise overview, right? Literally in the, in the name, a one pager. And I have to say, it could be interpreted as once a single side or double side of a single page. Um, uh, one pager examines the context surrounding the uh, surrounding your issue. It supplies brief and concise evidence in support of recommendations. And um, that last phrase, in support of recommendations, this is not just uh, why it's an issue in general, it's why it's an issue and here's a solution to that issue. Um, outlines practical recommendations and points to further materials as needed, including contact information for follow-ups. Typically, right, in practice, it's a leave behind um, for policymakers after a meeting. So if you are um, you know, lucky enough to participate in a Hill Day in, uh, in Washington, D.C., or at your state capitol or your city hall um, or your county um, hall of government, government um, it's what you would leave behind so that they can, you know, digest the information a little longer, but also share it with potential supporters, um, their colleagues within uh, the government entity. Um, you could also consider an advocacy one pager to be uh, for fellow stakeholders to drive coalition building, drive support for your ask, for your idea. Um, it's important to make it memorable um, and relevant, of course. So by providing like illustrative narratives uh, and stories alongside the data and the facts, um, for those of you in you know cognitive sciences, psychology, right? The most efficient path to embedding information in a human brain is via storytelling. So highly recommended um, that you uh, really engage with that lens and that framing. So, oh, sorry for the formatting. Um, so before you start writing, um, really think about the conditions that surround your policy issue. And I have to say, right, this is a writing workshop. It's never about just writing, <laughs> right? It's about really um, putting on, you know, these lenses, um, for the po public policy world, because it's it can be so different than what academic training prepared you to make a difference through your science. Um, we really, you know, those of us who've been in policy for a, a little while at least, um, this is often our main message is to be aware of the world around you that science is part of society. It's not the driving, factor in society, right? And to just be humbled by that. Um, 
I, I had the good fortune of listening to uh, former NIH director, Francis, Dr. Francis Collins, give a talk um, about genetics in autism. And um, among a public audience, uh, at the end, a gentleman raised his hand and he said, you know, I've been listening to you for the last hour. Uh, I'm the father of a son, uh, uh, early adult son with autism who's nonverbal and gets very aggressive. And, you know, all that research that you've been supporting that you're clearly proud of in the genetics of autism that explains less than 1% of autistic uh, cases, that's all well and good, but I feel like I'm in a burning house and you're telling me about the chemistry of the paint. So just to recognize what the needs are in society right now, how the stakeholders are feeling, what they're seeing, and compare the various paths to make a difference in that topic, right? Public policy being one, with scientific evidence being part of that public policy development process. So understand the social and economic conditions, understanding the political will. And this is not just right at um, it, you know, within the within the government, right? That's um, understanding what's happening in um, in a, a constituency within a, a legislator's jurisdiction, so within their district. Um, have they had a natural disaster? Are um, people striking because of poor labor conditions? Are um, are there, is there infrastructure that's crumbling and people are complaining about that, right? If so, right, be aware of that, <laughs> right? And appreciate the time that a legislator, whether it's at city, county, state, or federal levels, um, you know, appreciate that they are dealing with that at the same time that they're dealing with everything else, including your a public policy topic. Um, so, you know, knowing your audience. It's uh, the first in a long list I have on the next, um, uh, in a slide or so. Um, but public policy, that's really, you know, where scientific evidence, right, the facts and social economic conditions and political will, that's where, that's where public policy lives. Um, so just be humbled by it. <laughs> um, okay. Before you start writing, um, as I mentioned before, identify and study your audience, right? Read the local papers um, if you aren't already. Decide on your objectives. You know, what do you want your audience to know and do? So to know and to do. Uh, again, that ask is um, a, a, a linchpin in your advocacy. Uh, determine one to two main messages. Uh, it's gonna be really difficult. There are countless situations that need fixing right now. Um, but for your advocacy one pager, uh, if you have anything, any more than two main messages, um, it's not going to land as uh, potently. Select only the information you need in order to convey the main messages. So once again, it might be awesome to know more background about the topic, but unless it is um, directly relevant to the ask and to your recommendations, um, it's uh, it doesn't belong in a one pager. That's for a longer piece of li uh, literature, like a policy brief. Um, and you know, just like science, this is not a concept um, that's new to us, right? The process is iterative. Um, we are not uh, just starting from square zero and building from a, a clean slate, um, right? We all policy decisions exist within the current situation, which is dynamic and changes from morning to night, from day to day, from week to week, and of course, from year to year. Um, oh man, this is something that I'm getting my uh, my grad students into right now uh, in the class, class that I teach currently. Um, gather feedback and buy-in from stakeholders. This is also not something um, as incentivized in science as I wish it was, um, but to, I have to say, living six years in Germany and I, um, before that in Sweden, um, if they love giving direct feedback, <laughs> positive and critical feedback. Um, to, and I 
got so accustomed to it that when I moved back here to the U.S. and people weren't being critical of my ideas, um, I interpreted that as them not caring enough, <laughs> that I was so hungry for feedback um, that I, you know, welcomed myself back into American culture, which is typically, um, you know, more often than not a little more careful about feelings and, well, maybe not today, goodness gracious, but in any case, right, on an interpersonal level, um, having that opportunity to, to really get someone else's perspective, especially someone with a very different perspective than yours, right? Different background, different neighborhood, different uh, STEM discipline, different sector um, altogether. So the faster that you feel more comfortable um, sharing your work and getting constructive feedback, um, the better your work will be public policy or otherwise. So throughout the process, continue to gather feedback and buy-in from stakeholders. Um, that buy-in from stakeholders, there will be uh, organizations, I almost guarantee you, um, who will have been working on a similar or the same topic for longer than you. And to be aware of that and to be respectful of that institutional knowledge and, um, and current leadership. So consider having a conversation with them prior to making any um, public policy concept more public. Um, of course, it also strengthens the entire solution and the process by which you'll advance that solution. Um, consider equity, as I started just talking about um, earlier, your voice is one of many. Um, in a big state like California, we have, you know, one state senator will represent nearly a million Californians. Um, I, th I think that's similar to uh, actually members of Congress represent less than that, to barely under a million. Um, so your voice is one of many. Um, and uh, consider the disproportionate impacts that policies have historically had and could have moving forward in populations and communities that have not been considered um, as fairly in the past and even ongoingly. Also be a little humble about your science um, and how it was collected and conducted um, and consider maybe if, especially if you're dealing with uh, the human subjects that um, the sampling is not always representative. Um, consider you know, medications like uh, for pediatric asthma cases, um, they work really great in white and Asian American kids not so great in Latinx and African-American kids. Um, so know all of that in advance um, before pitching a solution. So some principles, know your audience. You've heard that now twice already. Bottom line up front. So why is this urgent? What is the ask? What is the outcome you're seeking through a policy one pager? And I have some examples later on. Be clear and concise, no sentences that run for three lines, right? Um, you know, short sentences um, and, you know, build you know, sentences building off one another. Avoid jargon. Nothing um, puts, uh, puts a legislator out like feeling like they're being talked over. Um, a lot of public policy is ego management. Um, if you're familiar with the campaigning activities that are necessary to get into office, um, there it takes a, a, a little bit of a, an ego to put yourself on that stage and say, I can represent you, million people. Um, so avoiding technical jargon will um, avoid your putting out potential um, legislators. Writing in active voice, so rather than having um, something happening to them like uh um i don't know the field was destroyed by a, a storm or something like this um the storm destroyed the field right it would be more active voice than um passive provide digestible information so it can't be right your font size can't be a font size level eight you really need 
um, that information to be absorbable in the short amount of time. Like I said earlier, right? Some days these legislators, uh, right, elected officials are just running down, right? From seven o'clock in the morning until, you know, well past 10 p.m., right? Meeting with different constituents um, and uh, attending meetings, voting on issues that sometimes their staff will have between, you know, the 30 seconds between the walk from their office to the hearing room where they're going to need to vote on a particular issue, maybe yours, to actually take a look at that one pager. Um, so make sure that it's um, easily readable. A clear layout, right, that makes sense, reasonable and expected. Um, modify dull headings to be uh, informative. So rather than having a heading like, you know, background or introduction or, um, or conclusion, right, might as well use that really valuable real estate to actually summarize the background. Um, you know, African American children um, are underrepresented in research, something like this, rather than background. Um, of course, consider graphics, tables, always include captions. Um, you might find this in yourself, right? Scanning through, right? If you give yourself a minute to get the gist of headline news, um, your eyes will tend toward the graphics and the captions under the graphics in addition to the headers. So um, best, best practice there. And of course, your recommendations have to be actionable, right? You're not going to pitch something that Congress should do to your state representative. You're not going to pitch to the Environmental Protection Agency, something that the Health and Human Services Agency should be doing. Okay, finally, so a one-pager outline. Um, on the right, you see a graphic here where at the top is about the organization or, you know, if, if appropriate, um, uh, what the organization does, who you're representing. Um, it's, you know, chances are your legislator might um, have an existing relationship or at least a familiarity with an organization, which is why, part you know, participating using an organization, an advocacy organization as your vehicle um, is typically more efficient with policy change. Um, step two, right, a brief summary of the problem that you're seeking help on. Um, utilize your data and reference studies when applicable to support your position on the issue. So really providing that uh, the substance of why you're there um, and what the problem is. Um, Utilize as often as you can relative statistics. So rather than saying, um, you know, there are uh, 50 million more cars on the cars on the road now than 50 years ago, something like that. Say, you know, that you know, we have seen a thousand percent increase in cars on the road, right, during these conditions, um, right? It's, it helps again bring folks who are not subject matter experts and don't know whether 50 million cars is a lot or a little um, into that solution making um, and problem definition. Um, step three, uh, oh, and I have fancy lines here. <laughs> step three, a brief summary of the solution to the problem. Um, again, choosing that policy vehicle, whether it's a new program, an amended, uh, amendment to the program, uh, an adjustment to a rule or regulation, um, which case you don't need to go through a legislative body, you can go straight to the executive branch, the regulatory agency, um, and right, tailor your one pager to your audience. So what it will do for you or your community. So what will it do for district number, what are 58? Um, uh, step four, um, what your legislator can do to help, also known as the ask. So whether you're asking them to co-sponsor a bill that's active right now in Congress or to vote against a bill um, or support or to sign a letter in support of X, Y, or Z. Um, step five, include a list of supporters, um, such as a group of our other organizations that support your position or piece of legislation, co-sponsors of the legislation and or other letter signers. Um, in California, I am so proud to be in a state that says transparent as possible. <clears throat> if you look to see uh, how bills are analyzed um, through the legislative process by experts that make up policy committees, 
um, you'll see at the end of Bell analyses a list of supporters and a list of opposition who formally submitted letters, um, uh, you know, a week or so in advance. Um, sometimes legislators will flip right to that back page and want to see who's supportive, who opposes, um, and then start from there in how they uh, approach uh, or question a piece of legislation. Um, again, that relational capital is that really means a lot in the policy world. Um, include your contact information. It's just logistics for follow-up purposes. Um, when you're seeking out um, expertise, no need to reinvent the wheel. Like I said before, um, connecting with an advocacy organization that's been working in that field for so long and often knows some of these topics better than the legislators themselves. Um, for most legislative bodies, there are term limits, right? Around a dozen years is, uh, is uh, average in my experience. Um, and nonprofit or advocacy organizations have been around for much, much longer than that and understand just the roller coaster of how policy has changed um, in that time. So offices, people, experts, organizations who work directly in policy to provide those templates, ideas, and access um, to policy uh, levers. Um, these could include a government affairs office. Um, every university I know of has one. Um, advocacy organizations, I've really beaten that horse already, this uh, workshop. Think tanks, um, they could be you know, um, within academic entities um, or standalone um, think tanks, as I mentioned before. Um, scientific academies, most states have um, some kind of science academy. Uh, if you've already graduated, if you're no longer affiliated with a university, your alma mater, chances are, would love to support alumni um, in advancing their um, ideas and, uh, and efforts. Um, and even if you didn't participate in the public policy school, it doesn't hurt to at least try. Um, policy researchers, of course, academics themselves, um, who uh, I think in, um, I can think of a few in California who are almost household names, um, who've engaged and are at every public meeting, uh, providing that public comment around um, every topic possible. So finally, let's get to some examples. Uh, so this is an organization that is uh, advocating for uh, HB 42 and SB 5. Um, you can see um, if we, do I have it compared? Yes. Um, so it doesn't include a, um, uh, the organization definition. So you might assume that they have an existing relationship with this uh, with this uh, legislator, um, and therefore it's wasted space um, to include a definition when you know that they are already familiar. Um, the issue and by the numbers, right? Bullet points. Everybody loves bullet points, so recommend you uh, try to fit in some bullet points as much as you po possibly can. They separate they separate out the issue in kind of a you know, paragraph narrative form with by the numbers three bullet points that provide you know bolded um, phrases. Right, New Mexico now has an average of fifty more days of extreme wildfire risk conditions compared to 1970. Um, so this is their opportunity to really place those talking points um, that will drive the conversation that are the core anchors um, in a way that's uh, that separates it out, right? Consider if these were two paragraphs, it would be harder, at least longer to read. Um, the solution, clearly defined, um, right? Two quick bullet points um, with a follow-up about um, what more is needed, right? These two approaches combined with meaningful engagement with communities most harmed by climate change will help improve health outcomes, equity, climate adaptation, and climate resiliency in New Mexico. So again, that bottom line up front, support the Public Health and Climate Resiliency Act, HB 42 and SB 5, okay? I mean, you might just have to read that, see whose work, right, who the source is, um, and be good enough there, right? If you if you already trust this organization, but if you need additional talking points, if you're going to 
need to represent your decision to support this bill, um, these uh, five bullet points are, are key. Um, the ask was reflected in the title already, right? Support these bills. Um, supporters, I mean, they go above and beyond. They really want to pack in um, how much support they've collected. Um, they don't actually include contact information, which may have been a slight oversight, but once again, if it's for a legislator who knows you, right, has been a colleague now for years, um, that might be wasted space that you'd rather uh, provide support. Endnotes references are typically not included in a one pager, but in this case, you'll see that these are all just guidelines. Um, individuals and organizations have every right to uh, develop their own one pager as they see fit. Um, here's a one pager for stakeholder coalition building. Um, so I have a little zoomed in portion here. So right from the top, huge letters, federal legislative priorities, right? by the Americans for the Arts, an organization I actually know nothing of. I just liked the, um, the concept and the formatting, right? That we don't always have to think of, you know, in the previous example, right? Just section, 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 section. You can be a little more creative and we can trust the Americans for the Arts to, to come up with um, some innovative formatting to just be a little more engaging with the reader. So we have, you know, Americans for the Arts, right, is working every day to ensure that federal lawmakers understand the many policy areas that the arts impact in communities across the nation. So that is their definition of their organization, right? In that one sentence, we already know what this organization does. In this Congress, blah, 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 um, the ask is, is to click here to learn the latest status of each bill and to take action by contacting your members of Congress to support these bills. That's the ask. And then the you know problems and solutions, right, are, again, it's, um, I guess the problem is implied here. Um, and solutions are these different uh, policy levers currently active for stakeholders to support. Um, here's a back-to-back one-pager, right? Double-sided one-pager uh, by the Latino Coalition for a Healthy California. Um, I mean, they spend, right, precious real estate on this page just being attractive, <laughs> right? Just having an attractive one-pager um, that you're not overwhelming the reader in, you know, font size 10 from top of the margin to bottom margin. Um, it clearly, right, uses what font size 14, um, provides links so that, uh, you know, a digital user can click directly to um, each of these uh, legislative priorities. Um, we are running out of time, so I want to, um, this is my last slide here, um, one pager versus a policy memo. So policy memos, policy briefs can themselves be one pagers, right? one side or back to back, um, but you can clearly tell the difference between this one pager and this one pager. This is meant to be left on a coffee table in the legislator's office and for someone to be able to pick it up and know absolutely what this is about within 10 seconds. Whereas this might take you a bit more time to get through and really absorb um, you know, the, the depth of the, uh, the policy concern. So with that, and um, you'll receive these slides um, and probably NSPN will have a, a list of resources similar um, and maybe inclusive of some of these that I've found helpful throughout my um, policy science policy journal. Um, but I wanted to close with a heartfelt thank you very much for having me and uh, look forward to next eight minutes of Q&A. Uh, my email is down there on the bottom right hand side of the screen. Um, I'm, I'm not just not just saying that to be I'm not just saying this to be nice. I love follow up conversations uh, from these workshops. Um, and like many people in policy, I'm also extremely busy. Um, and so reminder emails is like my love language. So if I don't respond, um, please just follow up, um, maybe even multiple times, because I legitimately would love to continue to support you and your pathways into policy. 
um, we need you. We need your scientific minds um, and your energy and your uh, ingenuity to really make the change we want to see. So, Piyush, thank you um, so much for letting me have this floor. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you, Julianne. That was an amazing and very insightful presentation. Yeah. If you have, uh, I, I see one question in the text about what would buy in mean? Okay, yeah, excellent question, Oksana. Um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, so buy in is, um, let's say, um, Natural Resources Defense Council. They're a nonprofit organization that do a lot of really awesome. Um, science-based advocacy for natural resources, environmental issues. Um, and they've been working on, you know, these, um, you know, forever chemicals called PFAS for ages. Uh, they've been advocating literally since the 90s um, and maybe even before, um, at least looking into it. So if I'm doing research on PFAS, right, in an academic setting, and I come to uh, the conclusion that, oh my gosh, we need to ban PFAS chemicals from, um, let's say, firefighting uh, materials, right? Firefighters are being exposed to this. They're getting cancers at higher disproportionate rates. Um, we need to ban PFAS. Well, someone has already thought of that issue and it's done so much work in that issue already that it would be more empowering if I go to NRDC first, Natural Resources Defense Council first, to have a conversation about, well, my research is showing that you can actually right, um, substitute some of these alternative materials that work just as well, but are less harmful than these forever chemicals. Um, and to have their buy-in and have their engagement and have their support of your topic um, so that they don't feel like you are just going a parallel route and utilizing their work um, without them getting credit for all that work. Is that, does that answer your question? All right. Yeah. Those in audience, please feel free to ask your questions. Um, since I, I do see two questions now, so um, Shishen, thank you. Um, what forms do buy-in usually take? So organizations um, who might start advocating for your project as well. Um, there's another kind of element factor lens of buy-in, and that is um, if you are going to legislators, <clears throat> um, there's a kind of a hierarchy, right? Those legislators who are chairing important committees will have much more sway than those um, who don't have that kind of um, decision-making power um, or just coordination, of the, you know, the right to coordination um, and coordination responsibilities. So um, having the buy-in of, right, the advanced support for a concept from those decision makers who will actually be influencing the course and the success of your uh, public policy idea, that's also collecting, that, that's all, that also falls within the realm of collecting buy-in. So you basically, it's just a gathering of support, but in a strategic way. Um, there are all, there's also a spectrum of stakeholder engagement um, that you know, on one side of the spectrum, you have you know, informing stakeholders. So you know, if there's a, oh, let's stick with uh, forever chemicals, right? Firefighters are a really critical stakeholder, right? So having their support, and there are like so many other um, stakeholders, there are organizations that represent only fits firefighters. So having their buy-in, having them engage in conversation, does this look like a legitimate um, policy solution. Piyush, do you want to choose the questions? I see that there are quite a few. Uh, yeah, so one very good question is, like, what, what are your advice on writing one pages that would ap appeal to people from all political views? Hmm. Well, 
Um, there's a common response to policy decisions that people on either side of the aisle will provide, and that is, we agree with your goals, we don't agree with the method that you should go back and think about it longer, which just kind of delays the whole process and derails um, any uh, any momentum that you have. Um, so I would actually recommend um, huh, that you toss that <laughs> dream um, from the get-go and utilize your one pager as a tailored advocacy um, document. So similar to when you're applying for a job, you don't use the same cover letter for job A, B, and C. You have tailored cover letters to each of those different companies or organizations. Same thing with one pagers, um, that you're know, tailoring the solution and right identifying the problems that apply to that the district that the official represents. So you know you wouldn't want to. Um, you know, it doesn't doesn't make sense to go to a legislator who, you know, only represents like a desert region and talk to them about, you know, sea level rise um, as uh, as the main um, impact of climate change, right? You will talk about further desertification, right, of um, water sources or something like this. So sorry to, to shut you down a little bit there, um, Ashley, <laughs> but um, for your own uh, for your own benefit. Um, I think focusing on tailored one pagers will get you farther than trying a uh, potentially unobtainable um, universal one pager. Thank you. So since we are about to reach an hour, uh, before any other question, I have a survey for the audience. Uh, there are two questions and we would use your response for the next session. So please go ahead and fill out the survey. I, is it visible on the screen? Okay, thank you. And in the meanwhile, if Julianne, if you have one more minute, maybe I can ask one more question. Sure, not, happily. Yeah. yeah, so where would you start? So there is a question by Casey. If I have, a, I have an idea, where would I start? <laughs> um, so I would start um, by joining an advocacy organization in that field and see what they're talking about and see if that idea is even on their radar. Um, and then just start contacting people. You might only get, you know, two out of 10 responding to cold emails for informational interviews. All you need is 20 minutes. And I have to say, it is some of the the highlights of some of my days are chatting <laughs> with, um, you know, trainees, students, fellows, um, you know, younger folk, uh, you know, earlier stage folks in public policy. Um, we love to just share what we know and spread that institutional knowledge. So advocacy organizations are really expert in many of these topics. Um, <clears throat> there's a phrase in California legislature that there are just no new bill ideas that just seems like ideas just continue to be recycled. Use that, right? And have those conversations and, and be courageous and um, reach out to, uh, to invite um, folks for uh, informational interviews. There are some, there's some guidance out there. Um, NSPN, I'm, I would guess that you have some informational interview um, guidance. So yeah, you, you, you've already done a wonderful, you've already taken a wonderful step by joining an SPN or participating in events at least. So I really commend you on that. Thank you again. So it's time to head over to Jane. And before that, I would just like to say, if you have any qu more questions, please reach out to Julianne directly or email to NSPN and we'll be happy to get back. Thank you so much, Julianne. That was fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Very informative. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. I did put a survey in the chat. You might have to go back a little bit to find it. Um, so a post uh, workshop survey. And we hope to see you back November 6th at 6 p.m. Eastern time for the second part of our workshop with uh, Dr. Adriana Bankston. Thank you.